morning. Uh, welcome back to the uh, second day, the working day uh, of uh, PICRI 2006. And uh, I'm happy to uh, be able to kick it off with a, a phenomenal keynote. Uh, Calvin Trillin uh, reports that when asked how he should be introduced, he suggests that the presenter err on the side of effusiveness. <laughs> and here I'm going to marry uh, effusiveness with some brevity. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mitch Kapoor. Mitch is the president and chair of the Open Source Foundations Application, uh, of Applications Foundation, which was founded uh, five years ago. And it promotes the development and acceptance of high quality application software developed and distributed using open source methods and licenses. This is a theme we have not yet discussed in this conference. Um, but we're going to touch on it here. What is the role uh, of, of these technologies? He's widely known as the founder of Lotus Development Corporation and the designer of Lotus 123. So speaking of Lotus, um, last year my wife was struggling over the quarterly nanny taxes, which is the one financial thing that she does in, in the house. And I asked her if I should set up a spreadsheet for her. And she's a bright woman, she's a writer, but she's not a big user of technology. And she said, a spreadsheet can't do what I need to do for this. <laughs> and I asked her to show me what she was doing. And she pulled out a yellow legal pad with several columns of numbers, all summed at the bottom. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, she became the beneficiary of Mitch Kapoor's transformative technology. <laughs> So last spring, I emailed Mitch to see if he would keynote this conference. As most Americans, he wasn't really familiar with what a PCHR is. But he didn't say no. I think it sounded interesting to him. And as I recall, uh, he had just filled out one of those annoying clipboards at a recent medical visit. And as a result, there was some extra resonance on that particular day. So I think he immediately saw, though, the set of challenges that we face. And I'm thrilled that he's here to help us think about overcoming those challenges to produce a transformative technology in healthcare, the PCHR. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to come speak with you this morning. Uh, I'll have quite a bit to say, but I thought I would actually try to start um, by showing you a little media clip that illustrates some of the themes uh, of the conference. So if all goes well, um, this will just work. With computers, we know that it's always the case. It just works. Pizza Palace, guaranteed hot in 30 minutes or it's free. This is Mary. May I take your order? Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. Is this Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. Uh, Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number is 610204999A-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you live at 736 Montrose Court, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for this, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that allows us to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all future claims of liability. What? Do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. The total is $67. $67? Well, that includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. Hmm. You could save $48 if you ordered our special Sprout Submarine Combo and picked it up yourself. Comes with tofu sticks. Those are very tasty, sir. Good value, too. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67, then. You just bought those tickets to Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? Oh. But I see you checked out the budget beach bomb at the library last week. Up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the sprout subs. Good choice, sir. Gotta watch that waist if you're hitting the beach, eh? 42 inches. Wow. <laughs> and I think no more sprouts is, like, required. That's how much? 
just between you and me, there's a $3 off coupon in this month's Total Men's Fitness Magazine. Your wife Betty subscribes to that, right? Anyhow, clip that and it's $19.99 even. Whoa, looks like you maxed out on all your credit cards. Bring cash, okay? Want to stop this from happening? So that's a um, clip that the ACLU put together that I think speaks for itself as one kind of dystopian future that I don't think actually anybody wants to have happen, but sometimes there are unintended uh, consequences of new technology. And uh, uh, we'll get back to the subject of privacy at the end of the talk, um, but I thought just a little bit of media would wake everybody up and get people's attention here as we, as we try to dive in. So, perfect. Um, I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm barely even a novice when it comes to healthcare issues. Uh, I know quite a bit about information technology. Uh, and what I've already found in coming last night to the reception is that we live in a world of mutually incomprehensible acronyms. So I have my uh, IT acronyms, of which IT is probably the best one. And there are a lot of healthcare acronyms, uh, which I find completely baffling. So if I unintentionally lapse into uh, an abbreviated form of speech here uh, uh, and use some acronym nobody knows uh, what that is, please stop me. Um, the way that I decided to uh, think about this was considering that first as a, just as a, as a citizen, uh, it's pretty obvious that the healthcare system in this country could stand uh, a bunch of improvement. Um, and that IT can, uh, if done the right way, can uh, make a difference. Uh, so the problems, speaking very, very broadly, this is the context in which I want to approach this, are, are numerous. Uh, you know them much better than I do. We don't have uh, universal coverage. Uh, there are big disparities in treatment between uh, different groups. And despite the fact that Americans on the whole seem to be unaware of this, uh, we are less healthy than other developed nations, but we spend far more per person for health care. Uh, and we go about it uh, in, in what's a very inefficient uh, kind of way. So it seems like uh, information technology could uh, help here because it has helped productivity in lots of other sectors of the economy. Uh, its benefits have largely not been brought into health care yet. Uh, but the fact that it can be part of the answer doesn't mean that it is going to be part of the answer. And in fact, there are an endless sequence of cautionary tales in which uh, IT was uh, brought to bear on very, very large systems uh, that were extraordinarily expensive and embarrassing failures, uh, particularly the ones that come to mind that I know about are in trying to redo the systems of uh, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, the FAA, the Air Traffic Control System, and the FBI all are hundreds of, bill, hundreds of millions uh, of dollars of, uh, of lost investment. So IT is not some kind of magic wand that, uh, that we can wave and, uh, and, and fix things. And a very important point to me is that there is one, uh, more than one way that information technology is brought to bear on solving uh, real world uh, problems. Um, there are really contending visions of uh, what's the right uh, architecture uh, to, uh, to bring to place. And there have been a series of battles over the past 30 years that I've been in the field uh, of different architectures uh, for uh, solving uh, IT problems. Uh, one of the main axes of battle has been whether uh, systems are going to be proprietary uh, or whether they're going to be open. Um, and that has two important dimensions uh, that are related but uh, not identical. One has to do with uh, standards by which these systems operate. Uh, are, they, are the interfaces uh, uh, publicly available or, or not? Uh, 
Uh, and the other is the means by which the software uh, itself is made, the production process. Uh, is it the proprietary production process that we're familiar with, or is it this strange sort of new and perhaps not entirely trustworthy open source beast where nobody really owns the software and it's given away for free? Uh, and how can that possibly work? Another uh, dimension of difference is whether the systems that are built uh, live unto themselves in their own worlds, whether they form, in other words, kind of walled gardens, uh, or whether systems are really interoperable and work with each other and support a more uh, heterogeneous uh, view of, of the universe. And then a third recurring theme in uh, uh, IT is whether the systems that are built uh, function on a principle of centralized control in which uh, authority is, is concentrated and uh, proceeds in a downward hierarchical fashion, or whether control is more decentralized among the various stakeholders and participants and uh, things proceed more by uh, coordination. So uh, these are uh, um, very important dimensions of difference. Uh, I coined a saying some time ago that has some currency uh, on the net, which is that architecture is politics. And what that means is that the architecture of the IT systems has extraordinarily important implications uh, in the realm of power. Who has it? Who gets to do what? Who is subject to that power? And if you pick the right architecture, some architectures are more generally empowering and some are, are less empowering. And it's very important to do that kind of uh, uh, analysis that um, connects up the, the architectural dimensions of IT systems, for instance, along the lines of those uh, axes that I talked about a moment ago with uh, what the impact of those, of those systems are. And just to let you know, I mean, if it weren't already obvious, I, uh, while I'm trying to be descriptive here, I'm not an impartial bystander. I have always been on the side of um, open versus closed and decentralized versus centralized. Uh, in addition to uh, Lotus, which you heard about, I'm also the co-founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which was really the first organization to actively uh, promote uh, and protect civil liberties uh, on the internet form back in, 19, uh, back in 1990. Uh, but I'll try to, uh, uh, despite the fact that I, uh, I have a particular bias, try to, as best I can, give you sort of a fair description of how some of these issues uh, are likely to, uh, uh, to play out. I came uh, in from San Francisco yesterday. I flew in, so I wasn't able to make the first day session, but I came to the reception and I tried to quickly interview a number of people to get a sense of uh, the meeting and the participants and the major, uh, the major issues. And, and one of the things that I learned is that uh, there's an interesting intersection of groups that perhaps do not talk to each other uh, as much as they might. Um, uh, conferences like this are wonderful uh, for convening uh, a larger community of people who ought to be talking to one another. One of the dimensions of discussion, I understand, was in terms of driving forward with um, um, health records, where is the driving force going to come from and to what extent is it going to be kind of patient-centric, come out of the clinical care community, come in a bottom-up sort of way of here's really you know, how to do it right. Uh, and to what extent is it going to ultimately be driven by the health, the large healthcare providers and payers who have lots of economic power? Uh, it's not an either or, but those are two very different starting points from which uh, to begin to uh, look at the world and develop systems. Uh, and in fact, the, I'd add that the providers don't live in um, you know, an isolated uh, universe. There are also very large consumers uh, of healthcare, large corporations with very large healthcare bills uh, that wield uh, a lot of economic clout who are in, potentially in a position to put pressure on the system uh, to respond in ways to control their costs. So all of that is going on, very complicated, very interesting. And the addition I would make to that is that there is a third possible driver, and it's not mutually exclusive, 
but I think it, it, it deserves a, a mention of its own, which is that to the extent to which disruptive technologies take root, technologies that are not currently kind of in the, in the picture or expected to make um, a huge difference by the existing stakeholders, to the extent that they take root, it can cause very large scale power realignments and cause outcomes that nobody is, uh, is anticipating especially if they give rise to uh, various entrepreneurial opportunities uh, by which people who are not, and, and companies who are not currently players in the system, uh, have an opportunity to enter and to make, uh, make a difference. So I would say that's my career history in a nutshell, because that's what happened with the personal computer, uh, that's what happened with the internet, uh, that's what's going on right now in a number of ways, and really that's the possibility that I want to focus on uh, which is to talk about the ways in which some of the uh, more open uh, architectures of information technology systems have had a, an interesting disruptive effect uh, and could have one today. So I say interesting and disruptive. Uh, um, what I want to say about that is not all of the consequences of uh, a new disruptive technology are good by any means, and in particular they can be uh, extraordinarily destructive to the uh, interests of the existing participants in, uh, in, in, in the system. Uh, but they can also be very um, enabling. So uh, I want to talk a bit about uh, my history uh, with respect to that. But I would say that uh, you know, personal controlled uh, health records, the right infrastructure for that, would be an enormous enabler for kinds of things that simply can't be done today. And I'll share in a bit what my entrepreneurial imagination came up with, just assuming that something like that existed. And I said, oh, well, we could do this, and we could do that. And I got very excited about it. And that's what gave me the, the conviction it was worth pursuing this, this theme of how, uh, uh, how disruption might play a role. So um, I tried to look for some commonalities between the experience of the, the onset of the personal computer uh, and also the onset of the internet. And, and what I'm talking about by onset, I mean a critical period in computing in, uh, let's say, from the 1970s to the 1980s, sort of pre-PC and, and post-PC, post the, the, the first golden era of personal computers. And similarly with the internet, I'm talking about the transition from the uh, small, non-commercial, government-funded ARPANET of the 70s and 80s to the commercial uh, internet of, uh, you know, of, 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 uh, that we have now. Um, there is a transition from, uh, in which the dominant characteristics of the architectures move from closed to open, move from hierarchical and centralized, misspelled, to decentralized and coordinated, and move from islands isolated islands to uh, interoperability. And that's what I want to look at. Okay. The reason I think it's important, and this is the case I'm going to try to make, is that open systems have some fundamental uh, advantages in terms of permitting uh, much more innovation uh, to happen simply because they allow more participants to come in in an experimental way, do unanticipated things, many of which don't work, but some of which uh, 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 do work, uh, and that, I see another typo, this is what I get for waking up at three in the morning with my uh, West Coast jet lag. Um, uh, empower lots of participants to be uh, players in a system in which they weren't players before. So my conclusion, uh, just to broadcast that in advance, is that if open systems are nurtured, they tend to dominate closed alternatives. What do I mean by nurtured? I don't think there's any inevitability here whatsoever. And I think that uh, n new technology paradigms can be very fragile uh, when they start. Uh, they don't uh, survive uh, on their own necessarily. And so they have to get some type of foothold or have a way of getting to a point where they can be self-sustaining. That's what I mean by nurtured. But if that is allowed to happen, then because they support more innovation and because they empower participants, they tend to dominate the more closed alternatives. That's my thesis. Okay. 
So now I need to give some evidence for this. Um, personal computer. Nobody was expecting the PC. This is hard to remember since it is so ubiquitous and dominant, but those of you who are old enough may think back and remember that. It, the PC, if you go back to the mid-1970s when it began as a hobbyist phenomenon, pre-IBM PC, widely dismissed as utterly irrelevant to what was then thought of as computing. I mean, it's easy to understand why. Their machines were small, uh, not powerful, couldn't do very much, weren't connected together at all, and, and simply were inadequate if judged by the standards of uh, the day of what computing was, so mainframe and, 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 and mini computer computing. But the PC as a platform represented a fundamental shift of power from uh, people who were uh, insiders in the computer industry, which was quite small and quite closed at that time, uh, to entrepreneurial outsiders like myself, who had no degree, no cachet, no entree. Uh, I could not get hired uh, at Digital Equipment Corporation uh, at, at, at the time. And the only thing that saved me when I bought my Apple II was that I didn't have to get anybody's permission to begin building applications for the PC. Because nobody would have given me that permission, really. It's, uh, uh, and there were a lot, not a huge number absolutely, a lot of people like that. And some of them wound up doing uh, very brilliant and, and transformative things. Uh, I did not invent the electronic spreadsheet. The credit for that goes to a gentleman named Dan Bricklin who was at the Harvard Business School at the time, who did the very successful first generation product nobody remembers anymore called, uh, called VisiCalc. Uh, Lotus 123 was a second generation product for the IBM PC. It, it represented a number of very fundamental improvements uh, in capability, in speed, in, in ease of use, uh, in user programmability. And it was transformative because it is a fair statement to say that um, the availability of Lotus 1, 2, 3 is the thing which made the personal computer ubiquitous in business in the, 19, in the 1980s. People were buying computers uh, to run Lotus. And we built a big, a big company out of it from nowhere to 50 million in sales and then 150 million, then 225 million, all in three years, 83, 84, 85, and 1,200 employees in a public company. And uh, it started uh, a set of trends in motion that uh, you know, matured over, over the next uh, 20 years. Oh, and by the way, kind of fostered a counter-reformation. This is an important thing to note about these, these revolutions. They're very disruptive for uh, MIS departments, as they were then known, uh, when people began sneaking in their own computers, calling them something else, and, 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 and you know, putting them in their departments. And, uh, ultimately, what happened was that the corporate MIS departments reasserted themselves uh, and uh, sort of re-centralized power in the corporation because they were in danger of uh, uh, completely losing control of, uh, of the information technology. Well, so what about the PC ecosystem of the, you know, of, of the 1980s? Um, it was, in fact, quite decentralized, maybe anarchically so, uh, nobody was really in charge. There was uh, all of a sudden a very competitive market supplying a very large number uh, of software products. Um, and there was a, a shift from a, an industry that had been completely vertically uh, integrated. In the old days, IBM made everything from the semiconductor chips to the hardware, the software. Uh, they wrote themselves and they sold and serviced all of their own machines in the mainframe era. Top to bottom vertical integration flipped industry structure 90 degrees to one being horizontally uh, uh, stratified in that there was Intel uh, as the dominant microprocessor supplier and Microsoft having the operating system and different, uh, uh, different companies uh, selling application software. Well, were things interoperable? Um, to a significant degree, not entirely, but there was a big push on back then to make things work with each other simply because it was obvious that there was more value. So I can remember as early pre-1980, working with the creators of VisiCalc to develop something called DIFF, Data Interchange Format, which was a way of moving data from spreadsheets to graphing programs, because I had, that was my first contribution as a software designer, as I wrote a graphing program uh, for the Apple, you know, for the Apple II. 
Was it based on open standards? Um, partially, not anything like the sense of the internet standards that, that came later, but it was the openness of information that actually spurred the innovation. And I'll give you uh, another historical, for instance, uh, from the very early days. Uh, Steve Wozniak was a designer of the Apple II computer. Uh, back in 78, somebody went into his desk drawer and made photocopies of his notes and printouts of the internals of the Apple II computer uh, and uh, uh, Xeroxed them and started distributing them uh, through the Samistat. Uh, and all the Apple II developers uh, got a hold of it. Uh, Apple did not uh, claim this was theft of trade secrets. In fact, they were kind of happy about it uh, because it enabled people to learn the inner secrets and tricks of, of, of the Apple II and begin to uh, develop uh, systems. So there was an openness of information. It was not very well standardized. It was, it was poorly standardized. But the, the, uh, the lesson wasn't lost, which is that the more you permit people to do things, the more innovation you can get. And in general, that's a good thing if uh, uh, somewhat disorderly. So the big lessons, takeaways, there really is a piece of this which is build it and they will come. Lots of unanticipated entrepreneurial um, uh, activities. So I was thinking just a little bit without having any specifics about personal control health records at all. And I said, well, suppose it was the case. These are my top secret ideas, which I'm going to share with you today because I have a somewhat ironic attitude about top secret ideas. Um, you know, managing your own health care, it's, it's a big issue. And it's a big problem for, for individuals. Uh, the existence of the internet uh, has done a lot, mostly good, not all good, for enabling people to connect with information about whatever it is that they have. It's really changed the clinical practice a lot when, uh, you know, when the patient walks in with printouts of the Wikipedia articles about what they think they have. As I said, I think it's mostly good, but it's certainly not all good. And I was thinking, if my healthcare record was, you know, on a, like a USB drive and I had control of it, I might be willing to let someone that I trusted help be uh, an advocate for me and help me assess what quality of health care I'm getting. And it could almost happen in an eBay-like fashion. This is the really scary thing of a marketplace for people who are health care advocates uh, and, and, and assistants. I mean, they could be in India, for all we know. What we've seen on the internet are systems in which people are uh, willing to uh, transact with people and hire people they don't know and they haven't seen if they have enough faith that, for instance, on eBay, the reputation system uh, is going to pr protect them uh, from being taken advantage of. We tend to focus on where those systems fail on eBay, for instance, and we underfocus on the brilliant way they succeed so that there are, I don't know, 100 billion dollars of tra transactions on eBay between people who don't know each other and who never meet and they all they send each other their credit cards and do things. There is something going on there. And I'm saying if I had my health care data online and 100 million other people did, somebody would figure out a way to help those people uh, in a way that they could make some money in a way that is unlike anything that exists uh, right now. So. Um, and, and then, and I'll, I'll come back to this, if I'm now in the business of helping people uh, with that, I'm aggregating a lot of data because they've, they've made their data available to me. And being a socially responsible person, I'll do this in a way that protects their, uh, that protects their privacy. But having access to aggregated data, as we'll see, typically offers huge benefits and other opportunities of what, what you can do. And I'll, I'll come back to that. So I didn't get any further in my thinking other than saying, well, gosh, if this infrastructure actually existed and it was reasonable, people will have a field day figuring out what to do with it. And, and they're probably, play, for the most part, people that aren't participants in the system right now because they'll do things in a different kind of way. I, I understand, for instance, the thought of entrusting someone to advise you on a health care matter using something like a reputation system on eBay from a conventional perspective 
Sounds crazy. Sounds nuts. Sounds like maybe it should be made illegal. But it hasn't happened yet. And most of the really interesting new things, like eBay and Amazon and personal computers, also sounded very crazy at the beginning. So just sounding crazy and dangerous doesn't rule out the possibility that it could be a big deal. Okay. Similarly, the internet. Um, I spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. in the 1990s. We're supposed to be riding the information superhighway. It was going to be built by cable and telephone companies. I swear, I was there. I heard about this. Um, the computer industry was nowhere uh, uh, with respect to the internet. Um, Microsoft you know, had a near-death experience before Bill Gates turned the ship around in the 1990s because uh, they missed it. The online service providers like AOL and others were building these walled gardens. Nobody took the internet seriously circa 1990. Uh, it was under the stewardship, though, of, uh, of the NSF. It was transferred from, from the Defense Department to NSF. And NSF, in its wisdom, said, we will permit commercial activities to happen on it. Uh, and it was mirac so miraculously swift what happened with the invention of the graphical web browser and the first e-commerce sites and everything else that we have now developed collective amnesia about the prehistory of this. The, the internet and the web and the things that are increasingly completely integrated into uh, people's lives in, in the developed world were not seen coming, were not taken seriously, were not thought to be uh, of, of any importance. And how did that happen? And what was that about? And why did the internet win? Well, it's an extremely interesting system. I'm being perhaps a bit highfalutin by saying it had, uh, its design principles were, were democratic in nature. Uh, but I actually uh, mean something by that, um, which is that the way the internet was designed to function distributes power uh, very widely and operates under a rule of law. Okay, first, rule of law simply means that to be a good internet participant, this is whether you're doing email or web or whatever kind of service you're doing, you are supposed to simply support the protocols that have been defined as these open and public standards through the Internet Engineering Task Force. And to support the protocols, actually, uh, there's uh, literally written down in these documents called RFCs, there are tenets of good citizenship about what it means to support the protocols. So it's not a simply a literal uh, following the rules. Uh, it's more than that. Uh, so for instance, if you're designing a communications protocol that both sends and receives information, so email would be an example of one of those, there's a well-known maxim which is, that says, uh, be liberal in what you can receive, meaning when you write your code, assume that the people who are sending you things don't always follow the rules precisely. Uh, and have some tolerance for that. Be graceful about it. Don't just reject it. Don't fail horribly. Sort of do the best you can. That's considered to be a, mo a good model for uh, uh, implementation. Conversely, uh, when you're sending things, be conservative. Don't, you know, really try to follow both the letter and spirit of the law, excuse me, the, the, the protocols. Don't make it any more difficult for the people on the other end to receive, uh, you know, uh, what, what, what you're sending. And in general, the designers and coders have followed those rules with, with lots of success. It has permitted uh, the, the great heterogeneity of the internet to survive, that there's no one, you know, no one server, no one piece of client software. There's lots of different kinds of software, and it changes over time. And things can change because they're linked together uh, by these protocols, and people generally follow good citizenship. And it is a very decentralized architecture. The internet was originally designed as a network of networks, a way of networking together very different networks that had been indiv independently developed over a period of time. And the idea was not to try to get everybody to rewrite what they did to be do it just one way. It was to add a new way for networks to talk to each other. That's TCP IP, which is the, 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 the base protocol for internet transmission. It turned out to be such a good idea that over time virtually all of the more uh, uh, proprietary and specialized 
communications protocols originally used on all of these networks have faded away and everything is going TCP IP. There's also what's called increasing returns to scale. People have gotten very good at doing that protocol and building hardware that supports it and it's kind of economically, uh, it, it, it makes sense to do. But the, uh, the internet was designed as a network of networks and it was designed to put the intelligence at the edges. They said, is a real temptation to build a smart network that uh, uh, where in the middle of it there's some very smart hub or switch and will let us do very cheap devices at the ends. But the problem with that that was recognized is first it wasn't going to suit the needs of having uh, distributed uh, innovation uh, and development. And those systems tend to be very fragile. They have single points of failure if they have a lot of smarts in the middle. If, if, if they're not quite as smart as they think, the whole network goes down. And so there was a philosophy of building this thing in a way that where the network itself was relatively dumb and lots of intelligence at the edges, giving people the freedom uh, to try lots of things to succeed or to fail. And then when things worked at the edge, they could sort of migrate, uh, migrate uh, around. This was very empowering. Uh, and the empowerment was kind of an emergent uh, 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 phenomenon. Uh, the internet's mantra is anyone can. Anyone can set up a server. You know, anyone can write a client. Uh, anyone can do almost anything that anybody else can do on the internet with a very few uh, exceptions. There are very few choke points uh, where there's a, a sort of a single point of control. So I looked at this decentralized architecture in 1993 and I said, ah, Thomas Jefferson would have loved it. Now, of course, I had no idea what I was talking about then because I didn't really understand Jefferson, but it, it turned out to be not completely wrong. This idea of a decentralized uh, uh, system was more or less what Jefferson had in mind versus Hamilton, but that's, that's, another, uh, that's another talk. It worked well. And those architecture principles being baked into the internet are really what was responsible for its success. That and the fact that it had been incubated for a long time, for almost 20 years, so that even though it, it was pre-commercial as of the early 1990s and the number of users uh, were very few, what worked, what was there actually worked. And I'm convinced that that protected incubation period actually is also uh, a huge factor responsible for its, its success. And there's, there's a lesson there. If they had tried to kind of start the internet at the same time Oracle was spending $100 million trying to deliver video on demand in Orlando, Florida, uh, and, and Silicon Graphics, a, a complete failure of a system. If the internet had started at the same time, it might not have gotten too much further. So the incubation actually, uh, actually made a difference. OK. I want to talk very briefly about some of the information dynamics uh, on the internet uh, as we've seen it because they, they play a big, a big kind of role. Um, there's this odd phenomenon that people have noted called the wisdom of crowds that we see operating all the time, uh, but not just on the internet. At a state fair, they have the guess the number of jelly beans in the jar contest. And the odd thing about those contests is they take a very large number of people making guesses. And virtually always, the average of everybody's guesses is remarkably close to the actual number of, of beans in the jar. There's some phenomenon by which there is wisdom in the aggregate which can come together. And we'll see some examples of that. There's disintermediation, meaning uh, in previous systems, uh, there were participants in the middle that are no longer needed because the participants on the ends can interact directly uh, with each other. Uh, and on an open network, there are also opportunities for open access and open content. Uh, and there are some additional risks, big risks, uh, to privacy, as we've seen. So I want to take a look at each of these quickly. Um, there's a lot of power in the data. People have exploited this. Uh, in internet businesses, Tim O'Reilly, who's a leading a pundit, says data is the new intel inside. Uh, the leverage of businesses through aggregating data has been amazing. Uh, just look at Google and eBay and Amazon. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually convinced one of the 
several important reasons Amazon has succeeded uh, has to do with their user reviews. Uh, there are a huge number of them. They're actually quite decent. Uh, and anecdotally, I know that people uh, depend on them a lot. Each person just writes their one or two or six reviews. But in the aggregate, the fact that Amazon has those and can present those makes them a much more attractive source from which to buy books online than, uh, uh, than the alternative. Um, I'm working on a little internet startup right now that is attempting to build a new search engine by aggregating together bookmarks. Uh, can't go into the details here, but we've collected about 50 million instances of bookmarks, actual bookmarks that people have in their browser. And it turns out that they can be mined very effectively in a way that's much better than conventional search engines for certain problems. For instance, um, what website should I go look at to learn about, you name it, triathlons, prostate cancer, where to buy a digital camera? If you try to do that on Google, you get a very mixed bag of results. If you are ap able to extract the wisdom of crowds from the fact that we have 50 million bookmark instances, you can do a lot. So if you give patients control of their data, uh, it is very empowering to them individually, and it will be very empowering in the aggregate, and it will follow directly from these, from these internet uh, examples. We've seen lots of examples of disintermediation already. Craigslist is killing newspaper classifieds. Uh, uh, Priceline and Expedia have changed the travel industry uh, dramatically. Um, and uh, <laughs> editor-controlled reference works, uh, with the intermediates being editors, are being uh, challenged by the Wikipedia in a major way, and I'll talk about that more uh, in a second. Um, there are some big impacts of disintermediation that I think are going to come to play in healthcare. Uh, the first is uh, cost savings uh, uh, to people. Um, you know, free uh, classified listings, cheap seats on airplanes. It's not good for newspaper, newspaper publishers and travel agents. So people who are intermediaries could very well be displaced in, in unexpected uh, sorts of ways. Furthermore, the, the quality and value proposition of sort of these corpuses, that's the right form. Corpora. Corpora, thank you. It's been a long time since I had Latin. Um, are different when they're aggregated together via the internet. Uh, the, the quality, I would say, and, and hence the value, is simultaneously, uh, it's worse, uh, it's better, and it's different. And um, we're going to have to get used to that. Now, I don't know how this is going to play out in healthcare, but I'll tell you how it's playing out in encyclopedias. Um, the Wikipedia is extraordinarily counterintuitive. I mean, totally, utterly. The idea that you could build an encyclopedia entirely on uh, uh, the backs of volunteers who are not uh, experts to make something that is uh, useful. In fact, it's so counterintuitive, people still don't believe that uh, it actually works and are expecting it to, to fall over uh, at, at, at every moment. And the information quality, though, when put together this way, is here's what I mean by worse and better. It's sometimes worse if somebody edits an article uh, who doesn't know what they're doing and nobody catches it and there isn't a kind of guaranteed quality control process. But it's simultaneously better because when problems uh, do surface, they can be rapidly fixed because it is a completely open system. And so, um, uh, I think it's redefining what it means to be a reference work. And I'm, I'm looking ahead into the future. But now, Wikipedia, for instance, if there's a major historical event, like the naming of a new pope, the entry for the individual who is the pope, Colonel Ratzinger, can be and is updated immediately, you know, within minutes of the announcement. So if you go look up in Britannica, who's the pope? You know, it's got the wrong guy. Um, the idea that reference works aren't always completely up to date is, I think, going to become a commonplace. It seems odd now because we haven't been able to do it. 
But I predict that our kids and grandchildren are going to look back and say, what do you mean it didn't always have the most recent information? And this is incredibly important for healthcare because when information is a matter of life and death, having the most recent and most accurate information is incredibly important. And while I can't tell you what form Wikipedia-like things are going to take with respect to healthcare information, I would bet and give long odds, again, that, that it will have a major and transformative impact that people need to understand now. These systems with open content, they're fundamentally more improvable, and I believe that over time, the quality of information is actually going to be higher. And by the way, there was this interesting study, you may well be familiar with it, that was done in, in uh, Nature about the quality of science articles in Wikipedia and Britannica. It was very contentious. Was the methodology right? Was it fair? Was it not fair? You can judge for yourself. But um, one takeaway of it was that for that set of articles, the quality, and this was already done a year ago, uh, was roughly comparable. Uh, roughly comparable, which is to me a completely amazing thing. So, now to complete the circle, and come back to where we started. The fourth major dynamic of information on the internet is the increased liquidity <laughs> that uh, information has when it's stored in a digital form. A lot of the functional privacy that people have enjoyed has actually been a function of the fact that the information was in some high friction state and couldn't easily get out. It was sort of bound up, even if it was theoretically you know, uh, available when stuff, for instance, is printed to actually you know, uh, get it out. I mean, it involves photocopying, and it's, it's, it's expensive and time consuming. And, and that ACLU video really speaks for itself. If something is not done to stop information from flowing everywhere, it will flow everywhere. And that is a genuine uh, issue to which I think that there is not um, a simple solution. It's in the character of the digital representation of, of information. And people who will tell you that this is technically solvable are smoking a very interesting recreational chemical because people who are, uh, in my mind, the experts on security will tell you there is no secure system uh, which can't and, and won't be broken given incentives. So, Part of the equation of what has to be done about the privacy dimensions of all of this, which are obviously huge, is to look at the kinds of institutional and other problems that uh, can result. And in particular, to the extent that there are incentives, I said corporate incentives here, but there could be incentives, there could be government incentives, could be incentives of you know, malefactors to exploit personal data, we have to look at what can be done to either counteract or remove those incentives. You know, rule of law societies work, actually, because most of the time, most people follow the law on their own without having to be told to do that. Uh, that's what makes it possible for law enforcement to have a hope of dealing with that part uh, of society that doesn't do that. And it's going to be the same thing here. If we don't have a set of institutional arrangements and a social contract about what's private and what isn't, then it's not going to work and technical solutions are going to be um, of no uh, avail. So there, there needs to be a lot of accountability because, and this is my, I'm putting on my editorial hat right now, there is not in the currently fairly centralized architectures <laughs> we have, uh, in healthcare, there's not a lot of accountability. A citizen <clears throat> finds it very difficult to hold to account an institution that does not do the right thing. For one thing, there isn't a lot of transparency of records and access to information. And for another, the um, tendency is to force people to have to go to the legal system uh, to seek redress. And we know that that's uh, also another broken part of the system. So if we're going to succeed, there will have to be some new type of social contract about what institutions agree to do 
what the safeguards are, and it'll be a matter both of technology uh, and of policy, and there'll have to be the appropriate uh, uh, accountability uh, you know, uh, mechanisms uh, to keep that in place. That's a very tall order, uh, and it's one of great concern, and I wish I had uh, an easy answer for you, but I think the future will not only have lots of uh, potentially lots of uh, empowerment and lots of innovation, but uh, we'll have um, things uh, that we really don't like to see, perhaps not uh, as, as, as blatant or as ludicrous as the, as the ACLU video. But the, the, the final factor on the privacy issue that I, I want to mention is people don't value their privacy typically until it's too late. It's kind of like uh, in San Francisco, which I moved to a number of years ago, all the people who built their houses up in the Oakland Hills, knowing that there was an enormous fire risk, but when the 91 fire came, it, built, it, it burned hundreds uh, of uh, homes, almost 1,000, and people were really sorry, and it was a big mess, and then they took fire risk seriously and did something, but there was an enormous amount of damage. And so uh, the kind of uh, you know, risks to privacy and harms that could be done may have to be very major in order to give people a wake-up call. I hope not, but that could, that could happen. So, um, no magic bullets, but I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. As you uh, proceed ahead uh, in this important work, there are some time-tested design principles from PCs, Internet, and other uh, digital realms that I think could be usefully applied. Uh, to distribute the work among many coordinated parties. Don't put anybody in charge of this, and don't let anybody arrogate to themselves the huge amount of power saying, we are going to fix this, we're going to do this right. Uh, that's almost certainly not going to work. Another uh, potential flashpoint will come uh, with respect to openness and intellectual property issues. I haven't had time to talk about all this. But in every other enterprise sector, when it comes to shifting into a more open world, the whole question is going to be whether the uh, participants are willing to build uh, the protocols and the standards in a way that uh, they are not encumbered by intellectual property protections, typically patents, of the people who develop the standards. If there's patent encumbrance, there will not be open source software uh, because open source people will not uh, develop with a kind of a you know, royalty liability hanging over their heads. It's, it's, it's strictly incompatible. And so I would be on the lookout for whether or not in the great thing someone once said about standards is that there are so many of them. Um, in all of the standards that are being brought together from pharmacies and hospitals, and, and other sectors, whether they're being done in a way that is uh, un, uh, unencumbered by intellectual property protection. And don't sacrifice interoperability, I would say, above all. I would take less functionality and delays in schedule as long as things, things, things work with each other. And those people who share a vision for more open and more decentralized kinds of systems really should be cognizant of the fact that there's inevitably going to be enormous resistance to it because all of these successful disruptions wind up displacing people. Uh, I lived in Boston for 27 years before moving to San Francisco. I remember when there was a mini computer industry here, Digital Equipment Corporation, Data General, Prime, Honeywell, Wang, all gone. All disappeared off the face of the earth. Tens of billions of dollars of, 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 uh, of, of market value gone because those companies were not able to uh, understand they needed to reinvent themselves and make a transition. People are a lot smarter now. Businesses learn, other institutions learn. And what that means is that change actually becomes even a bit more difficult. Uh, and it's going to take some, uh, I think, cleverness uh, and, and, and patience uh, and, and, and willingness to compromise uh, in order to move things forward in this more open direction, but I certainly think it's worth the battle and worth the struggle. So thank you for letting me share my thoughts with you this morning. I, I think we have five minutes. We have five minutes to take okay. questions, and yes. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm intrigued by your middle bullet on this last slide here. Uh, tell us a little more about how much intellectual property oh. protection Sorry. was afforded to the Lotus One Two Three, and uh, talk a little more about yeah. the tension between royalty freedom or yeah. open standards and the need for more innovators. I presume that you, your own invention, was protected by intellectual property. You're very happy with it. We had um, copyright protection that prevented people from making uh, literal copies of the product. Uh, my successor attempted to extend that to protect the look and feel uh, of the product, but I actually opposed that. It was a very difficult uh, kind of moment uh, for me. So we had uh, minimal protection. Somebody said to me, well, suppose uh, VisiCalc had gotten a patent on the spreadsheet which they could have if the patent office had been issuing patents on software then, I said, well, I would have gone and done something else. You know, I, I'm, I'm unfazed uh, by uh, the claim that you need strong protection in order to encourage innovation. If you look at software development as a whole, and I teach a course on this at uh, UC Berkeley in the information school, so I've been looking at this lately, I think this whole software industry is reinventing itself to build on top of open source systems in which there will be some uh, you know, minimum uh, and modest level of protection, but the, maximal, the idea that maximalist protection is connected to and necessary for innovation, I think, is, is an old idea whose time has passed. It will be debated a lot, but, and it's an important question, but that's where I come out. Uh, speaking yeah. as an expert in privacy is one of the big uh, things to be worked out. Have you seen, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, focus in healthcare on role-based access control as a solution or a large component of the solution. Have you ever seen role-based access control as being compatible with the kind of things you talk about in your presentation? Now, I know what role-based access control is. I don't know how many people do here, but let me, I, I what I was trying to, no, I haven't seen it, not yet. It's complicated. It should be tested, rolled out, and we should get some victories with it, and we should stop thinking about it as a silver bullet. There's no silver bullet. Uh, it, there's silver buckshot. Uh, so it could be a valuable piece of an overall solution, but again, when you know the answer is framed in terms of this is the approach, I always say it has to be a combination of uh, technology uh, and policy in a synergistic kind of way. In general, indirect means, if there was an interesting sandbox, uh, interesting data sets to play with, um, that people could sort of discover and try things on their own, um, it's more people needing to be attracted into it to find their own reasons than a kind of a, um, you know, conversion effort. It's slower, it's messier. Um, but it works better, I think, in the long term. That's why I said, it, you know, kind of, if you build it, they will come. If there's sort of interesting data sets or interesting opportunities, that's what's going to attract people to work in things, especially if they can do their own thing, especially if it's possible to make a constructive difference with a modest amount of effort. This is one of the secrets of op successful open source projects, which is that if there's too big a learning curve to get up to speed, and if you have to do too much in order to make a difference, it's going to drive people away. If your project is one that has a gentle slope onto it, doesn't take too long to learn, and you can feel like you're doing something constructive right away and get recognized and feedback from it, that helps too. So I'm not doing justice to any of these questions, but the let's move on. on. So you talked about yeah. you know, if there's interesting data sets available for people to work with. Yeah. A lot of our time here is spent thinking about, OK, 
say, how do we standardize the data sets that all can potentially make available to consumers in their affordable programming? But another way of looking at it is, you know, don't make that priority. Focus on making the data available as it is today. Document the formats. Don't worry about standards. And you know, expect that the community will still take those data sets and you know start playing with them. Maybe come up with the next one, two, three, 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 because at either extreme, there are fatal problems. Uh, it will be the heat death of the universe before everything is standardized. On the other hand, the kind of Wild West just <laughs> take it. I'm on a roll here. Take it as it comes. I've seen lots of cases where things are just so screwed up and impacted that people can't work with it. So I would think having maybe a small data set or a small subdomain taken as it is but made available in some way that encourages people to do things with it from which there is some learning, is this working or is this not working, would be a good idea. Because none of these things, they're all iterative. And so one of the secrets of innovation is to have a fast cycle. If it takes five years between the time you think of something and the time it comes out, it's a problem. I know I'm involved in one of those projects. And it's been a real learning. It's better to do something that you can come out with uh, very, very, um, you know, very quickly and, uh, and iterate it. Well, maybe the visit to the emergency room is what at my uh, kid's school they would call a teachable moment. <laughs> maybe people are, uh, you don't want to exploit the people in a moment of vulnerability, but if there's a circumstance and all of a sudden they're looking at things differently, however that might be, maybe part of what ought to be built into that is sort of a request or a follow-up for whatever it is that's going to help them if this ever happened um, again. I think a lot of the way, to right now, there isn't, as far as I know, any significant amount of uh, personal, I still can't get the, pickly, is that, is that how we're pronouncing it? It's, it's theoretical, you know, it's not actual. What I'd like to see is to get it to be 1% actual, good, bad, or indifferent. It doesn't really matter, and see what actually happens with it, because it will change the nature of conversations from theoretical conversations to actual ones. And that's what happens. Once there was you know, a PC you could develop an application for, or an internet anybody could buy a connection on, the conversation just changed totally. And I think that's the stage that things that are in right now. So it's fine to convene stuff, but we've got to get to 1%. One last question. Um, you talk a lot about intellectual property with regard to building yeah. stuff. Yeah. In our sphere, a lot of the intellectual property comes uh, with modern In our, I said, we talk about how the IP is building the stuff, but in our sphere, a lot of the IP comes into the content. Mm -hmm. um, the both the commercial interests of the healthcare providers who don't want to share, or I'm from the National Cancer Institute, and we're the video because they're system on your principle. And the researchers that want to share, do you have any advice on the incentives of others to want to score prying loose the content of the system? Yeah, prying it loose probably. Cold dead hands, well, okay. Cold dead yeah, I would look for where the low hanging fruit is. I wouldn't try to pry it out of the hands of people who are really resisting. I would try to make a success story 
out of some area where there isn't organized resistance. I mean, this is the Wikipedia story again, which is that you'd never win any argument suggesting that people build the Wikipedia. They just, you know, they'd laugh at you, they'd throw you out. No, you build it and it exists and now you have something. And so you, it's, you have to use some, ultimately all the data from the Framingham Heart Study and everything, it's all gonna be open content. I guarantee it, I'll go on record. But it's not gonna look like that for a long time, and the trick, and you're the experts on this, is to find some data set now that's interesting that people aren't completely clutched to and build a thriving open content ecology around that then becomes an existence proof uh, and becomes, becomes a lever. And you, I don't think you can skip that stage. I, I agree, and on that note, I want to thank you for the Thank you. editorialize by uh, asking you again, consult a paper we wrote um, that's in your proceedings on health information altruists uh, that was published in the New England Journal. We're actually taking that very, very seriously. We're trying to mobilize cohorts of patients actually outside the normal vehicle because even the frame of heart studies with NHLBI funding, there's a lot of friction in getting the data out to researchers for secondary root analysis. So I think there's an opportunity there in much of the spirit that uh, it's just rough. Uh, thanks, Mitch, for a, a terrific, uh, a terrific talk. Uh, very uh, on target uh, for someone coming from uh, outside and exactly uh, 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 what we hoped and, and well beyond. And uh, Pete, if you're uh, off of email, uh, so the um, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, we uh, are going to take uh, just a moment out of uh, the day's uh, proceedings to uh, uh, very fondly recognize uh, uh, really a founder uh, of this, uh, of this uh, field and this concept. And I'm going to now let uh, Zach uh, present the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioinformatics Award for Innovation. This is a real snappy title. <laughs> In personally controlled health record infrastructure. Don't clap yet, because I have something to say. So, um, so this is hopefully the first of uh, several such annual awards we're going to uh, give out, and I'd like to give some context, uh, context uh, because I think it's uh, it's also revealing of, of our uh, trajectory. In 1993, I was with Pete Solovich at a um, vendor conference where we saw a crowd gathered around buzzing with excitement uh, about the following thing. We couldn't didn't know, I didn't actually know what it was, so we elbowed our way through in <laughs> our usual fashion into the center of the crowd, and it was a, a company called SMS, which I think has been acquired by Siemens, I could be wrong. Correct. It's correct, thank you. A company called SMS and a company called HP, which we now uh, still know, and uh, they had just uh, created, no the medical business. which is no longer in the medical business, uh, no, that's not true. Right. They're, they're still in the consulting medical business. Um, had just announced a interoperability between their uh, the HP ICU product and the SMS administrative uh, mainframe product. And essentially, the interoperability consisted of uh, allowing each system to open telnet uh, terminal windows on the other system. That was it. So. Um, uh, Pete and I were at that point uh, not uh, sure whether to be uh, more appalled about how bad the integration was or how excited everybody seemed to be at that uh, relatively incremental step. And so we went on and did some interesting things in distributed uh, uh, health information systems subsequently with uh, the funding of the National Library of Medicine. But then Pete, uh, as he often did uh, and does, took me by surprise, because as we were worrying about these very, very uh, pedal to the metal issues of integration, he came up with a v uh, vision of what we should be doing that was crazy in many, many dimensions in the, in the sense of craziness that Mitch Kapoor describes the PC revolution seeming to the mainframe purveyors. And the vision was 
as follows. So th this is now 1994, that uh, patients should not only have full control of their record, but all the decision support that really matters should be directed towards their personal record and towards them, making sure that the medications they're taking are not going to, in fact, uh, cause them to have an adverse event. So foreshadowing all the um, quality and error prevention issues but fully on the patient's side, uh, more positively recommending uh, appropriate therapies, putting the uh, patient in touch with the appropriate uh, groups, getting outside expertise on a, on a free market, and basically um, bargaining uh, commercially for various healthcare services. And this whole vision was uh, called by Pete the Garden Angel Project. And the Garden Angel Project, if you go to the, uh, if you Google the way, uh, the Wayback Machine, which is from the Internet Archive, the earliest I could find it was 1997 um, a web page on the uh, on which describes the Garden Angel Project. And there's the Garden Angel Manifesto that you can see. And where does the Garden Angel Manifesto come from? It comes from an ARPA project that ARPA, in, again, uh, you just heard about the role it played in um, internet, and ARPANET actually funded, remarkably, uh, Pete's Garden Angel uh, project. Uh, but then unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, ARPA became DARPA again, and it, since Garden Angel did not go boom, it got defunded. Uh, nonetheless, uh, that, that, that was a quote from the DARPA director at the time, by the way, that he only wanted to fund things that went boom. <laughs> <laughs> well, if he had really told that, we could have done this. We could have we could have put the sound sound effect in the earlier protest. Any case, <laughs> then um, eleven years ago, uh, Pete Salvich was having many many such discussions about his great idea. Most of the time uh, being dismissed as a crazy MIT visionary professor. One person who did not dismiss his ideas was a certain Robert Kolodner, who uh, was then one of four CIOs at the um, uh, Veterans Administration. And um, I just uh, recently uh, uh, got a copy of a note uh, that I've been allowed to share with you from Robert Kolodner, and he says to Pete, by the way, our personal health record that you inspired 11 years ago is scheduled to activate the upload feature for all vets from Vista A to PHR, my healthy vet, by the end of the calendar year. With a few more standards, we should be ready for the first version of Garden Angel. So that's uh, some interesting uh, uh, impact. But that's not all. Uh, about six years ago, sauntered into town a woman who was here yesterday, but I don't see her right now, uh, Carol. From the, uh, from the Markle Foundation, who had very, very similar ideas, had seen the, the Garden Angel Manifesto and wanted to learn more. And we spent, I'd say, on the order of about two years, Ken, with her and the Markle Foundation and uh, her colleagues, really debriefing them fully on all the aspects of this um, vision. And I think you've heard uh, some of the things that this has resulted in. Also, interestingly, one of Pete's former students, well, there's two former student stories. Um, eight years ago, one of his former students, John Holamka, uh, liked this idea very much and implemented maybe the first tethered PHR, the patient site uh, PHR, which is, as you heard from John Holamka, been working for several years now, providing patients with access to everything except pathology reports and uh, HIV studies with a one, for that a one week delay. That too, I'd say, is big impact at the, ca at the scale of uh, care group. Another student of Pete's who took his class and heard about the, um, the uh, Garden Angel Project was uh, Roy Schoenberg. Roy Schoenberg was a uh, right Israeli trained physician who then went on to found a company called CareKey. CareKey was then um, purchased by Trizetto. And again, you see uh, Pete's influence. Uh, last, 
Lastly, I didn't even know that connection. <laughs> oh, one of the, the first programmer on um, the Guardian Angel project, thank you, was uh, Sean, Do Sean Doyle. Uh, Sean Doyle uh, implemented uh, the first version of Guardian Angel when Java really did not work. And we kept screaming at him ah, to get this done, and he's like, we barely have a compiler that works, and yet he actually did it. Uh, Sean went on to uh, uh, work with a com uh, software company called Amicus that did um, uh, uh, compression, basically, of video for use of, uh, of imaging for the, uh, for the purpose, wavelet, using wavelet technology for the purpose of radiographic imaging. And then he and uh, Adrian, who's with us today, uh, found MedCommons, which is very much in the Guardian Angel spirit, uh, PHR, uh, style company. Um, lastly, uh, for the um, Indivo project, which I tried to spare you details about just because I didn't want to put our personal slant in, but I can now say that this is an, an used to be called the Ping project, and then uh, was uh, is now called the NLM project. So this is a project which just took a tiny sliver of Pete's vision, just the, the personally controlled medical record part of it. And the reason we took a tiny sliver is because Ken and I had spent about four or five years trying to get grants to do the Garden Angel project. And every time we submitted it, we had one of two responses. Either what this was, this is a crazy vision, completely unachievable, or it's already been done. <laughs> and li literally, and there are some important foundations uh, said that. So by carving it down to uh, the sliver, namely uh, of the just uh, personally controlled health record, uh, we were able to get an interested party, namely the National Library of Medicine, which we would always be grateful for, for having un understood the vision and, and uh, worked with us. And we've actually uh, now have a full, free, open source uh, piece of software that is now being used at several sites. We have some visitors from Canada that are using it as a backbone of their, of their uh, implementations, and we have several implementations. Uh, occurring around the United States. And so, uh, and then I would say this very conference, this very meeting, is a, a direct product um, because we organized it and we were his uh, disciples and students. And so I can say that this meeting is a direct result of his efforts. And so I'm glad to give this uh, first uh, pick reward from the Harvard Medical School Center for Biomedical Informatics to Professor Solvich. And I say so in, in recognition that We've only done one very small part of the vision, and we hope we can achieve uh, the rest of it for a while. So I don't want to give an Academy Award-style speech, uh, but uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, I really appreciate this. And of course, what it reminds me of is, is the fun part of being a professor is that you have an opportunity to interact with incredibly smart students who can then go on and do things that uh, I personally couldn't ever do myself. Um, but providing a little bit of guidance and inspiration and education to them uh, is what I enjoy most doing in the world. And I'm happy to see that um, some of this has borne fruit uh, in the work of a lot of people that I see around this room and, and other places in the country. Thank you very much. Now, of course, I'm, I'm a grandson.